Uh, so my name is Ben Nunez. I'm the CEO of Little Star. Uh, Little Star is a content distribution platform for virtual reality and 360 video. Uh, we really enable content distribution across devices uh, in headsets on mobile. Um, we are live on all of these platforms today. Samsung Gear VR, the Oculus, uh, Android, iPhone on the web. Uh, and we enable sort of the distribution of this content across devices for consumers uh, to discover, watch, and share. You simply uh, will be live on, on the Sony Morpheus or Sony PlayStation VR and the HTC Vive uh, in Q1 and Q2 of, of next year. Um, we are aggregating sort of the premium best content from uh, all over media, from Discovery Channel to DKNY and PBS, uh, Michelle Phan, uh, War Gaming, um, Disney. There are a number of different content uh, companies that we're, we're aggregating content from through a number of different ways and then uh, distributing that. Um, I love this slide. We, we got a kick-ass team. Uh, we're based here in New York. Um, we, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality experts, a bunch of repeat entrepreneurs with successful exits, uh, math geniuses, some of the best engineering talent in the world. And uh, we got a New York hustle that just can't be beat. Um, but let's talk about some virtual reality. Uh, this wasn't one of our finer moments in virtual reality, um, but uh, I think the most poignant aspect of it uh, is that virtual reality is uh, about to change the world. Um, it is an immersive and mind-blowing experience like no other. It can really transport you into worlds and experiences uh, that you would otherwise never be able to uh, enjoy. Uh, it actually feels like you're, you're really there. Um, over the next several months, the uh, consumer headsets will be launching. Uh, the Gear VR by Samsung went on sale for pre-order last week and will be shipping this week. Uh, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive will go on sale, consumer versions, uh, in Q1 of next year. And the Sony PlayStation VR uh, will be right around in, sometime in Q2. Um, the market for VR, um, you know, this is from DigiCapital. They, they forecast it's a $30 billion market uh, in the next four years. Uh, a lot of gaming, of course, uh, some hardware, software, content across various categories, but really nobody knows. Um, everybody's guessing. None of this stuff has come out. Uh, we have yet to sort of experience anything like this before, so everybody's guessing. Um, there are lots of terms that are out there in terms of the type of content and uh, what you're seeing on Facebook and YouTube and elsewhere. Um, virtual reality, immersive media, 360 video, uh, spherical video, cylindrical video. Everybody's sort of grouping a lot of this all together and just calling it VR. You may have seen the New York Times uh, distributed a bunch of Google Cardboards and was calling it New York Times VR. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in the industry that are, you know, the old school VR pioneers who are, you know, aren't happy about the, the use of the term virtual reality in some of these experiences, uh, especially so, some of the modern day enthusiasts as well. But it's, it's sort of a, an easy way for the consumers to get their head around, so to speak, uh, you know, what, what they're experiencing. So um, you see a lot of people sort of interchanging this stuff. We kind of call it immersive media. Uh, 360 video is something you'll see on Little Star. You'll see it on Facebook. You'll see it on YouTube. Um, you can use it on your, on your phone, uh, on the web, uh, but you can also put it into a VR headset. And so there's lots of sort of variations to this types of content uh, and how and where it's consumed. Uh, we're pretty excited as an industry about sort of mobile. Um, you know, the ability to watch this content, consume it um, on a mobile device, you can do so now today. Uh, you simply move the phone around. Uh, you can use your finger to, uh, you know, to move it around as well. Uh, you can tap uh, the button and, and go into sort of VR mode, which lets you put it um, into a Google Cardboard or something similar. Um, you know, it's you know, basically sort of load the video up, you tap a little button, you split it, um, you slide it into a device, and there's lenses inside of these devices uh, that lets you experience a sort of lightweight uh, virtual reality uh, experience. I love this, adjust lenses to reduce motion sickness. 
uh, it is, you know, that is certainly a concern in our industry. Uh, there's only certain types of content that can actually be viewed in these headsets. Um, so we, you know, as an industry sort of curate that stuff. A lot of it can be, you know, totally visible on a mobile phone, on the web, but the minute you put it into a headset, um, it can make you nauseous. Um, movement in that type of content is sort of the key driving factor. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of other things in terms of parallax effect and, you know, stitching and quality and frames per second that, that can affect those things. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, if we stick you on a roller coaster uh, and you're in a virtual reality headset and you're watching that piece of content and your body's not moving but you're completely immersed and your brain thinks you are, uh, you'll very likely get sick. Um, so we'll kind of talk about the different headsets that are coming out and sort of the, um, you know, what we can expect. I mentioned the Gear VR. Uh, you can pretty much buy that now. It is an untethered device, so there's no wires. You simply slide uh, any Samsung, any 2015 uh, Samsung mobile phone into the headset. Um, really high quality uh, experience. It's only $99, so if you have that device, um, highly recommend it. Um, it is, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about it. We think they'll have great success um, out in the marketplace. It is powered, the software that they use is actually powered by Oculus. So Oculus, um, you know, bought by Facebook last year for a couple billion dollars. Uh, it's their software that actually powers the Samsung Gear VR. So it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of years how that relationship unfolds. Um, you know, ultimately the, they are kind of competitive because Oculus is coming out with their own headset. Um, that is expected to, to launch in, in Q1 of next year. Uh, it is a tethered device, so there are wires, uh, there are controllers, headphones that come with it. It is connected to a very, needs to be connected to a very high-powered game PC. So um, you need to have a, a Windows machine that, you know, has enough uh, RAM and processing power uh, to be able to, you know, to power this, the, the Rift. Um, so, you know, we think that market's going to be sort of niche early on. Um, along with the HTC Vive is the same thing. You need to plug that into a pretty high-powered game PC, although the experiences are phenomenal. Um, they are more immersive than, than you may imagine if you haven't experienced them yet. Um, the diff the, one of the biggest differences between mobile VR and sort of the, some of the Samsung Gear VR uh, experiences and these devices is uh, something called positional tracking. So... From the outside, they use cameras to detect where I'm standing and uh, in real time can uh, compute that information into the headset. So if I lean in, I actually feel like I'm leaning in inside the headset. Um, whereas in other ones that don't have any sort of external positioning tra positional tracking, uh, you move around and, and you don't actually feel like you're moving around inside the headset. Um, so these create incredibly immersive experiences um, you know, beyond what we're able to do with a mobile phone. Um, the HTC Vive specifically is really what we're calling room scale VR. It's kind of the modern day home theater. You need a, a 10 by 10 room uh, because you can actually walk around inside and, and, and you know, feel like whatever you're uh, looking, inside at, looking at inside the headset is where you're walking around. Um, so we, again, we think it'll be a, a sort of limited market with the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. Uh, I'd say the one we're, we're really excited about is the Sony PlayStation VR, uh, formerly called the Sony Morpheus, which I thought was a cooler name. Um, it is, uh, just connects up to the PlayStation. So again, it is also a tethered device, um, but there will be, by the time the PlayStation VR launches next year, there will be 50 million headsets in the market. Uh, we think that seeds uh, an incredible you know, base of consumers who can buy this. Um, the price point will be attractive. They can bundle it. Uh, Sony can make their money elsewhere. And so we think the adoption of the Sony PlayStation VR will be, um, will be higher than everybody else, with the exception of maybe the Gear VR. Um, adoption of these headsets, sort of similar to the market size, we really don't know. Uh, everybody's kind of guessing. Um, I mentioned that, you know, over the, you know, we expect that you know, roughly 30, we've heard 40 uh, more million headsets in the market in the next four years. Uh, we think the, you know, the, the tray-based headsets, these ones that you can slide your phone into, uh, will be a substantial size of the market. Um, the, the Rift and the Vive, sort of on the lower end of that size, uh, and then the Gear VR and the PlayStation VR um, are forecasted to have uh, equal distribution.
Apple filed a patent in 2008 for a, uh, a pair of glasses that you can slide your phone into. Um, they've really done nothing about it or announced nothing since in typical Apple fashion. So um, we, we don't know what's coming, although given from the patent in 2008, which was long before uh, any of the, uh, these other guys had been doing much, um, we, we anticipate something at some point uh, from them. The cameras, uh, how this stuff is captured. Um, you know, in traditional film, we've got a camera that's facing me, the guy's sitting right behind it. Uh, he's not in the, in the shot. Uh, in a movie, you've got 50 sweaty guys or girls behind cameras shooting a set. Uh, we can't do that in VR. Uh, we have to sort of hide everybody because we're capturing everything in a sphere. Um, a lot of these rigs are, are GoPro rigs. So Google announced a jump camera. Um, that is 16 GoPros, it is cylindrical, it doesn't capture up and down. Uh, whereas other rigs uh, that range from two to, to more capture every single degree uh, around you. And they're literally, literally GoPros inside of a oftentimes 3D printed housing uh, that then you know, the producers stitch all that, all that content together into a sphere. Um, the one on the right is a, uh, one of the most impressive cameras we've seen. It's a $600,000 uh, camera. It's, it's, a, it's a beast. Uh, there's guys out in L LA called Headcase. Um, sort of appropriate name. Uh, there are consumer versions of these cameras that are, that are out and coming out. This one right here is the Ricoh Theta. Uh, it is two spherical lenses back to back uh, shooting I think it's 210 degrees in each direction, so you can stitch that together uh, into a sphere. Lower quality, it's a $300 camera though. Um, we use it, it captures photos and videos, um, and then you can upload that stuff right to Little Star or elsewhere. 2D versus 3D. Um, capturing this content, most of, most of it is captured in 2D. Um, capturing it in 3D can be technically challenging because as you move your eyes across, you can reach a parallax um, that, that causes distortion and, and makes it difficult um, and can make you sick sometimes. Um, so a lot of times what people are doing is they're capturing this stuff in 2D and then converting it to 3D in post. Uh, with light field technology and some newer technologies that are coming out, um, that will make that easier. Um, although we anticipate that's, that's a few years away. Um, 180 versus 360, we're seeing a lot of content uh, in some cases get created where, you know, if you're sitting on a couch, you know, looking back and crooking your neck uh, might not be comfortable. Uh, every time we put somebody in a VR headset, they often, you know, they'll do that for the first minute or two and then they sort of settle into this field of view that is the human peripheral vision, which is about 210 degrees. So some people are shooting content for uh, that format. Um, we still believe in 360 that it needs to be, you know, fully immersive because if I do turn around, I don't want to see just a black screen. Uh, it sort of takes you out of the immersion. Um, but we'll see as an industry sort of what evolves here. Um, it wouldn't be a good VR presentation if we didn't talk about the elephant in the room. Um, porn. Um, you know, it's coming, it's here on the, on the heels of the sort of 180 and 360 and 2D and 3D. Uh, most of it's, uh, you know, 3D 180. There we talked about porn. The evolution of storytelling uh, also kind of needs to, and by the way, Little Star has nothing to do with porn. Um, sorry. Uh, you know, the, the evolution of storytelling, I mean, we really need to uh, evolve how stories are told. Um, you know, the consumer doesn't now, or the, the director doesn't control every single aspect of where people are looking anymore. I can look over here, I can look everywhere. Um, and so stories need to evolve. And um, you know, the industry as a whole is trying to figure that out. And, and a lot of the early content was sort of fly on the wall stuff. They'd stick a camera in a room and capture this and expect it to be compelling. Uh, and it really isn't. And so, um, but narrative content is starting to emerge uh, and get better and uh, leverage the 360 sphere in, in really interesting ways. From, you know, with First Mark, we might as well talk about VC investment in, in, um, in the industry. Um, from 2010 to 2015, 
Uh, 45% of all investment in VR has gone into the headsets and peripherals. 53% um, has gone into content creation, so the cameras, the stitching software, the tools, actual content. Um, only 2% has actually gone into uh, distribution. Um, of course, that makes sense because we've had to uh, first create the, the ways of capturing this content. We have to give consumers the way to consume it. Uh, distribution as industries and mediums evolve usually comes a little later. But if we compare that to television, uh, the displays, that's a $25 billion a year industry. Content creation is $37 billion, and content distribution is a $130 billion a year industry. There will certainly be uh, some of the incumbents who will uh, enter into this space, and, and some of them already have, uh, but, but we see huge opportunity uh, in the distribution of, of, of this type of, of content. Augmented reality. Uh, a lot of people believe that ultimately we're headed towards um, a world that, that is more augmented than virtual. And uh, the glasses that we might wear uh, will be just like the glasses you guys are wearing. Um, but that will allow us to augment our, our world around us or completely immerse us uh, and go into a virtual experience, um, which we're calling, calling, people are calling mixed reality. Um, of, you know, this is expected to be a much bigger, the same report that forecasted virtual reality at 360, or $30 billion uh, had augmented at 120 um, over the next several years. So, so really a huge industry. Uh, the big players behind that are Magic Leap. They've raised, um, you know, half a billion dollars from the likes of Google. They're raising even more. Uh, now it's uh, rumored to be, you know, another billion um, Microsoft uh, is really going all in on the HoloLens. Um, this is an, an augmented reality device. So um, this is kind of where ultimately over the next several years uh, we think all of this is going. Um, so thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, that's it. <laughs> One thing real quick. I found it funny that when I did Google searches, on these headsets. Every guy was a white guy with a beard. And uh, I don't know, it was just like the first things that came up, it was the same guy over and over again. I don't know what it was. It's pretty hot if you ask me. Yeah. Um, tell us about the little start a little more. So this, this was, by the way, a fantastic uh, sort of overview of the market experience. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, I mean, sort of in the, in the opportunities in this industry, um, consumer discovery of this content right now is a huge challenge. And as a lot of these headsets and devices start rolling out, um, consumers are going to be looking for, for one place uh, to get this kind of content. Uh, they'll certainly get it from a lot of different places, uh, but the idea that there's a place, a channel, a network uh, that you can tune into to get a wide range of content um, is really the opportunity that we see. Uh, we also see that this isn't just about sort of um, video. This is about the, the marriage of, of gaming and narrative content. So games are pretty hardcore. You, you, you have to know what you're doing. You have to um, learn the controller. Um, but interactivity in virtual reality and the ability, the ability to actually choose where you go, change stories. Um, we're working with, with companies who are creating a, a zombie movie and they want you to be able as a consumer to control uh, which weapon you slaughter the zombies with. Uh, you don't actually physically, you know, sort of use controllers to do it, but you get to choose the story along those lines. And we'll start to see some of the economic models actually creep in there uh, from gaming into, into narrative content and storytelling. So a lot of the efforts that we're putting into this, uh, into this company are going into sort of, you know, the next evolution of this. Certainly there's huge opportunity uh, today with our, you know, the phones in our pocket and the billions of those devices around uh, the world for us to, to bring this as sort of the gateway drug uh, into, into proper VR over the next couple of years. They're, they're pretty different. Um, you know, the production of, 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 a, of a movie or an experience or a game in virtual reality is different 
uh, from being able to augment my world here and make everybody in this room look different if I wanted to in an augmented reality glass or walk down the street with Chewbacca. Um, you know, any of these things are, are sort of in an augmented world are different. Certainly the, the, co the capture mechanisms um, sort of integrating content into an augmented way, uh, you know, we'll be able to, to achieve some of that. Um, and as the industry evolves, um, you know, we'll, we'll be right there with it. Um, so the ability to distribute content. And so if you want to augment, and, augment your world with, uh, you know, different types of stuff, um, it, it'll sort of the way content distribution will certainly change. It's not going to be like, you know, like Netflix or ABC television necessarily uh, in that sense. Um, but we believe that you know you'll you'll wear your glasses during the day and and enjoy an augmented world and go to a sports game and look at the player and get statistics about them, uh, but then go home and watch a movie uh, in those same glasses. Thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. It's an exciting field. I think your company participated in the Disney Accelerator. We did. Yeah. Maybe you can give us uh, your perspective as an early stage startup. What do you do? You've got a great idea. You're interning. Yeah, um, I mean, great question. We, so, you know, a lot of us are repeat entrepreneurs, and so it wasn't so much about the mentorship. We've actually, we've actually been a, a Techstars mentor uh, for a couple of years. So, um, you know, for us with those corporate accelerators, it was largely about um, deal flow and getting access to content and establishing relationships within Disney um, and even elsewhere. I mean, just being, for us being a New York firm, uh, spending, you know, we're, we're pretty well connected and, and have Hollywood relationships, but uh, forcing us to get out there and spend a few months. And, um, you know, we have deep relationships at Fox and Sony and, um, you know, the studios and uh, a lot of other sort of production houses out in L.A. Uh, we were able to sort of strengthen those. Um, you know, with, with corporate accelerators, there, there certainly weren't many others, any others that we would have considered. Um, you know, Disney gives you pretty, you know, great access to, I think we met with probably 70 of the top executives from, from Bob Iger, um, on down, so C level, you know, down to, to down to VP, um, and really established some great relationships. We got content out of it. Uh, we got some deal flow out of it, uh, and and we'll continue to do so. Um, I think it depends on the company um, and sort of what it's worth to you, and uh, both from a time perspective uh, and equity. Um, certainly wasn't for the cash either. Yeah. Or collaborative between multiple people. For example, for, for business, having a meeting where you are in your home, but actually you can see everybody that you are meeting. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, Altspace uh, is, is a company working on those types of social experiences, uh, second life type experiences as well. Uh, the ability to be sitting in a room, in a conference room, um, you know, with, with headsets on and actually feeling like we're all in a room together, although we might be distributed across the world. Um, training, education, uh, real estate. There's a lot of interest from the real estate industry being able to um, sort of take users through, you know, potential homeowners through tours of homes without actually having to, to leave your house and, you know, really feeling like you're actually there. Uh, I think there are large, you know, there's a wide uh, base of use cases uh, for virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, we're focused on media and entertainment primarily. Um, and so, you know, in, in a few minutes, that's what we, you know, what I just spoke about. But, you, but you're absolutely right. There's a there's a wide base of, of opportunity in VR. And I think, you know, focusing in for, you know, the, you'll see a lot of companies. There's a company called Striver that's, um, you know, focused on the sports world. Um, they are, you know, doing deals with NFL teams and baseball teams and basketball teams to uh, put players inside of headsets and put them in situations that they might not uh, otherwise be able to experience. So, you know, Jameis Winston gets drafted. Um, you know, put him in a headset and let him know what it feels like to have the linebackers coming at him, have him read, you know, receivers and defenses downfield. Um, those types of things are, are here now and they're happening um, and they'll continue to evolve. 
Hi, I'm doing a presentation of trying to understand what you actually do. And I said it on YouTube for the hour. It's a, it's a fine analogy. Uh, YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, uh, Vessel, Victorious, any number, I mean, there are a number of billion dollar companies who have, um, you know, created distribution platforms and discovery platforms for video. Um, VR is a completely new medium. And so everything associated with it from analytics, um, you know, to how the content is consumed is just totally different. And so we, we, are, we are following a similar, um, you can certainly make those analogies. Um, you know, but it, we, we believe that there's a fundamental difference between what YouTube is doing uh, and what we will be doing. So each one of YouTube announced they are starting a VR channel. Do you feel that they are a behemoth or something that actually do be to there, There's unique dynamics there. YouTube is all about, you know, is, is strongly pushing cardboard. They will not have an app or they do not have an app inside the Samsung Gear VR. So, um, you know, at least not currently. So. Um, it's a big discussion to sort of talk about the differences between what um, you know uh, YouTube is doing and what other opportunities exist inside of VR for content distribution. Um, there's a lot that, that we do on the cinematic side and storytelling side that we're that we'll be releasing in the coming months that um, you know they don't have and, and aren't going to be putting that time in. They're fighting battles on a lot of different fronts. Um, it's a big conversation to have, um, which I'd be happy to talk to you one day about. But yeah, yeah, sure. So speaking of YouTube and et cetera, now on the military aspect, have you, are you more of a hardware based or a software based? We are purely software. Yeah, we are content distribution. It is purely software. So, uh, so you can download our apps on any of the hardware platforms. Relying on the um, like entertainment industries, are they using any new technologies in the you know, headsets as they call them? such as optics, or et cetera? Yeah, I mean, every one of these headsets has their own optics and, and new technologies. And, and you know, I met, talked about positional tracking. Um, you know, there's a lot of new stuff that's going into these and uh, into these headsets. Yeah, yeah sure. Sure.